To spotlight the regulatory developments in the United States, we connect with Michael Goodacre of Buick in Wallingford. Hi Michael, how are things faring in the USA? Hi Cheer, thanks for having me today and allowing me the opportunity to speak to you and the Chem Connection viewers. As you are already aware, in 2016, the Frank R. Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act for the 21st century was signed into law, which was one of the first major overalls we saw for the Toxic Substances Control Act. The act included some key provisions which focused on existing chemicals, new chemicals, confidential business information, as well as sustainable funding sources for the program. Over the past couple of years, we saw EPA moving full steam ahead with implementing this law, and really this year proved to be no different. Great to know EPA is moving full steam ahead. Is there any news on EPA's progress with existing chemicals, especially the work plan 10 and high priority 20, in relation to risk evaluations and directions towards risk management? Yeah, from the existing chemical side of things, a noteworthy development was some of the risk reevaluations that were published after EPA announced they would do so back in 2021. What makes this so interesting is that this is the first time we're seeing EPA's whole chemical approach being put into action here. Essentially, EPA will assess and analyze each condition of use that was uh, indicated in their review, but the agency will make a single unreasonable risk determination for the whole chemical when the majority of conditions warrant one determination. You know, a great example of this was evidenced in the reevaluation for uh, HBCD, which is a cyclic aliphatic bromide cluster. Um, here, EPA made a proposed determination that the substance as a whole poses an unreasonable risk. Uh, this is mainly driven by EPA's prior assumptions that personal protective equipment was always provided to workers and that it was always worn properly. And under the re-evaluations, EPA is making the assumption that this is not always the case. Uh, based on violations of insufficient PPE, the previous assumption, it's unjustified, and as a result, EPA must reassess these chemicals. In uh, one of the re-evaluation cases, the removal of assumption of PPE also created new risk concerns for, uh, for uses from a human health standpoint. Uh, you look at the import of the substance, uh, processing applications, which include uh, incorporating into a formulation, a mixture or a reaction product, uh, incorporation into articles, as well as uh, recycling of extruded and expanded polystyrene. EPA, they didn't find any new unreasonable risks with some of the other uses that were identified, so that's uh, noteworthy. And then uh, lastly, when looking at the re-evaluations, EPA is expanding consideration of exposure pathways and uh, fence line community exposures, which really haven't been accounted for in the previous evaluations. Uh, EPA started developing a screening level approach to conduct ambient air and surface water fence line assessments and they're pulling together existing data and information to determine if an unreasonable risk determination really is warranted. Uh, another noteworthy development for the year are some of the record keeping and reporting activities that were proposed by EPA. One in particular is the asbestos form materials. Uh, under this rule, EPA has proposed a reporting and record keeping requirements for manufacturers, importers, processors of asbestos, and what's really unique about this rule is that it not only accounts for asbestos itself, but also minerals with asbestos form contaminants within. There's also no de minimis threshold, which was identified by EPA, which is uh, noteworthy. And what's really interesting is that activities such as this requires company to really look closely at their supply chains and to fully understand what is present in the raw materials they're purchasing from their uh, sources. Another good example is the proposed PFOS reporting that was issued by EPA. Uh, whether intentionally added, present as an impurity, companies, they have uh, PFOS in their products. They're required to report this information to EPA. So it's really something to uh, keep an eye on and to um, take a look at in the future. PFAS producers and users are highly impacted around the globe. At Chemical the Americas 2023 in March in San Francisco, we will spend a whole session on PFAS. Besides the existing chemicals, what are the developments in relation to the new chemical substances program? Yeah, Cheered, with respect to new chemicals review, there was a significant activity when EPA worked to amend the regulations regarding significant new use rules under TOSCA to really align more closely with what's prescribed by OSHA. 
you know, as a person in industry who was affected by a significant new use rule or a snur on occasion, I can attest that this is a pretty welcome initiative. Um, some of the changes that are noteworthy when looking at the amendments, you know, it includes EPA updating the SNR regulations to align with current OSHA and NIOSH regulations for respirators. EPA's respiratory protection regulations were adopted over 30 years ago, whereas OSHA and NIOSH were a bit more recent. Now, many of the respirators listed in the uh, EPA SNR provisions, it did not align with OSHA and NIOSH. So you can see right there, that's really a step in the right direction. You know, another change is that there's a hierarchy of controls based approach for requirements, which uh, aim to minimize occupational exposure. And, you know, probably the biggest impact here is where EPA amended the rules for hazardous substance labeling to really align more closely with OSHA's HASCOM standard. You know, oftentimes organizations are required to add certain phrases or hazards that EPA thought were warranted for a new chemical. And really that language didn't necessarily match uh, what was prescribed under OSHA a lot of the times. So under this change, manufacturers will now be allowed to use the OSHA HASCOM statements on their safety data sheet, as well as their label to meet some of the requirements that are set forth in the SNR. Good to know. I understand. There's also an update in relation to CBI? Yeah, that's correct, Jared. Uh, EPA has also made some significant strides on the administrative side of things this year as well. Uh, the first noteworthy activity is where EPA proposed a rule to update confidential business information, CBI requirements under TOSCA. Uh, one proposal under this actually states that if a chemical is on the confidential portion of the inventory but does not assert a confidentiality claim, the chemical identity would no longer be eligible for uh, CBI under TOSCA. In addition to asserting a claim, there is a requisite that the claim is thoroughly substantiated as well. It's going to be even more critical that those who submit information to EPA thoroughly review and substantiate their CBI claims going forward. Uh, some of the things that EPA is trying to achieve through this is to increase transparency and to you know, modernize the CBI procedures and to better align with the Lautenberg Act. Seems like a significant modernization proposal. Let's focus on the now. We just learned in November that EPA proposed to significantly increase fees chemical manufacturers would have to pay to evaluate chemical risk and that EPA would expand fees paid by companies that mix but don't make chemicals. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, a proposal came out from EPA that I'm sure everyone is going to be watching very closely and that is the proposed fee rule which modifies the 2021 proposal. Uh, under TOSCA, EPA is allowed to collect fees from the regulated community to offset 25% of the program costs for implementing sections 4, 5, and six of TOSCA. Uh, what this essentially means is that the cost to notify chemicals to the EPA, it's going to increase significantly. A PMN, we're seeing it increase from $19,020 all the way to $45,000. A low volume exemption is gonna go from 5,590 all the way to $13,200. And a big one is going to be EPA initiated risk evaluations. Those are increasing from 2.56 million all the way to over $5 million. Um, it's also worth mentioning that EPA is considering adding a fee to companies that submit a bona fide notice or notice of commencement. But you know, after considering comments from industry, different uh, organizations, EPA is not moving forward with that. So uh, that's good for the chemical industry. Uh, furthermore, EPA is also looking at issuing partial refunds for withdrawn PMNs based on where they stand in the process. It can range anywhere from 75% if it's withdrawn within 10 days of uh, EPA beginning their review, and it can go all the way to 20% if it's withdrawn within five days after receiving a notice that EPA completed the review process. Uh, as you can see, Chair, there's been a lot going on at EPA, not only looking at existing chemicals, but new chemicals, and you know also their plan for helping fund the future of TOSCA. Besides the revision of the TOSCA's fees rule, what can we expect in 2023? I think that when looking at 2023, we can really expect a few things. I'm hopeful that with the increased fees for maintaining the new chemicals review program, EPA can start to review pre-manufacturer notifications in a more timely manner. 
Uh, EPA has acknowledged that there's currently a backlog with submissions and they're doing their best to really move things along quickly. But I think with these increased fees and an increase in uh, headcount at EPA, this will uh, happen and it will move things along a lot faster. I'm also optimistic that EPA will honor their commitment to accepting new alternative methodologies or NAMs when reviewing new chemicals. You know, there's a lot of increased pressure to uh, avoid animal testing and to reduce it altogether. And I think this would be a big thing for the future. I would also anticipate that EPA will propose a rule regarding the implement implementation of a tiered data collection strategy. They'll likely use this to help them prioritize their risk evaluations and risk management activities. Uh, they currently have a bunch of this information through their chemical data reporting, but this will be a uh, new thing to watch. And last but not least, I would anticipate much of the same from what we saw in 2022. You know, we're seeing EPA make good on their promise to enforce the Lautenberg Act, and I think they'll try their best to continue to try to meet these prescribed statutes. Thanks a lot. Looking forward to seeing EPA, Michael and his peers in San Francisco.